Test Game 123. This will be the June 25th, 2014 City Council Workshop meeting. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order a workshop meeting of the City Council of Satellite Beach, June 25th, 2014, approximately, approximately, excuse me, 7 p.m. Uh, at this time, move on to agenda item two, discuss, take, or discuss, make recommendations on the capital improvement program priorities. Courtney. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the reason why we wanted to have a discussion on the capital improvement priorities is because I think last year when we created the first CIP to be included in the budget, and CIP I mean by, uh, I mean capital improvement program, we kind of just kind of threw that at you in, a, in the proposed budget. We never really got any direction from you whether you thought the, the priorities within that plan were something you wanted. Um, so we wanted to bring that to you this year since we have the format of the budget down and, and we're kind of less frantic. Um, and get and get your concurrence or your 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 um, approval and your direction if you want any changes um, before we put the proposed budget in front of you by the second meeting in July. Um, I did want to go over. We passed out a new version. Um, some of you have contacted me prior to this workshop with some of your concerns, and actually one of those concerns was the concerns of staff when we met. Um, earlier this, this afternoon, and we wanted to make sure that we captured that change. And that is um, to increase the annual street resurfacing for 15, fiscal year 15 16 to 300,000, and move the skate park improvements under the facilities section to the, to the fiscal year 16 17. So basically, we would be prioritizing street repaving over the skate park renovations. The other item was we removed the Lori Lane project, and we'll get into that reason later on in the, in the presentation. If that's something you want us to put back, we can talk about how that can happen. Um, and then we went ahead and made some minor adjustments to um, the wording of, the, of, the, um, of some of the, the names that we put down. I also wanted to call your attention to the fleet section. of the capital improvement program where we have patrol vehicle replacement. I made a mistake on this um, where we um, had put 45,000 every year. We actually um, are on the track to purchase one car in fiscal year 14-15 and then two cars in fiscal year 15-16 and then we alternate as such. That is, that create, keeps the city um, patrol v fleet on a eight year replacement cycle. Uh, so the 45,000 in 15, 16, and then the 45,000 in 17, 18 turned into 90,000 for both those years. Um, the other item that I failed to change was the total all funds. I forgot to alter the years. <laughs> so those years actually do correspond to uh, the, the 13, 14 on the total line should be fiscal year 14, 15, and we'll change that by the time we get to the budget. So I apologize for that mistake. Um, so basically what we want to do is we want to hear from you if you hear, if you think something's missing or if you think that something's out of priority, um, we can go ahead and make those changes prior to the proposed budget submittal. Thank you. Um, I'll start, if I may. Courtney, we talked on this a lot. Um, to me, storm order is critical um, and streets. I think of everything I see in here for at least the time being storm order in the streets, which we haven't done streets in a while, um, but storm order because it's such an expense <clears throat> item to the city, the way the lagoon is right now, that I just think it's something that needs to stay up. I am definitely a recreation fan, but if you tell me we have storm order piping that is 50 years old and it's 200,000 or something is going to redo the skate park, I'm really so until we at least get caught up on the storm water. And the only other thing I want to say that we talked about many times is any project I think we bring forward, we really need to know what it's going to cost three, five, ten years if possible, plus what's the man hours dedicated to it. Because I know on the CRA we had some um, 20 grand in for trees or beautification. Does Alan have the time? 
to do that. You know, where, it, where are we on that? I think every project needs to have that to come forward. So, anybody else? I'll just I'll just echo Frank's comments. I mean, I ride my bike around the city, and a lot of our streets are in really dire need of some attention. Um, you know, I also look at the Indian River Lagoon. It's an economic lifeblood to this area, not only for our home values, but for recreation and for the amenities that the Indian River Lagoon offers, not just Brevard residents, but it's it's 170 miles worth of um, economic benefit to all of the counties that touch it. And the stormwater issue is, is something that Satellite Beach has been proactive on over the years, but you know we're still in the mix of trying to get things accomplished in our city. And um, you know with the TMDL issue and the BMAPs and until they figure out exactly how um, we're supposed to meet all these new requirements, uh, you know I, I think it's going to be something that's going to cost us um, some additional funds that we don't have right now. Um, so, you know, we need to look at stormwater as a, as a major priority when we look at all of these capital issues. Um, another thing that I had a discussion today with an individual um, resident of our city who bought an electric car, and um, he's wondering if the city might be able to have some facilities for charging electric cars, maybe at the Schechter Center or the library. So, you know, we're, we're getting into new technology now. And, you know, these are just other capital needs that we need to look at as a city that might be something that's going to be beneficial to our residents down the road. So um, I want to at least throw that one out there, Courtney, that, you know, I think it's something that we need to look at going forward. <coughs> that's all I have for right now. Mark. Um, I did talk to Courtney yesterday, and, I, and I, the priority of those, I can, I can certainly go either way of the two that you mentioned, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know that the streets are getting pretty bad. I mean, there's some potholes out there, and that's what I hear more than anything else is what's going to happen with the streets. And we know if we get eight or ten inches of rain over the next two or three months, those potholes are going to get bigger, and it's going to become a bigger issue. But as far as which way those two flip, I'm fine. But I do want to see us do something with these streets because it's it's a major concern throughout this city. So that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else from the council? On yeah, I, I also have concerns about the streets, even in the newer subdivisions. Um, you're seeing a lot of deterioration and uh, just a lot of issues um, with them. And then just a question, Courtney, on the uh, parking lot resurfacing over at the uh, the football field and the soccer fields. Um, I, I can't remember. Wasn't that a priority um, to resurface? That is in really, really bad shape over there. Are you talking about the sports park? <laughs> yep. Um, I don't think it's surfaced. It's it would be it would be paving that road that that parking lot. But no, we did not conclude that as a priority. I, mean, I think that needs to be a priority, even if it's just um, I don't know if some mm -hmm. sand or crush and run is brought in there to stabilize it. If you go back towards the skate park, it's pothole after pothole and it's getting pretty dangerous so so we could look at maybe a temporary fix before we can afford the large one is that okay we can look at that do those um Alan, if, I, if i may sure. um the the parking lots in that complex as a whole um how do, how do we take care of those are those just graded when they get um originally when the the park was built um we put marl down and then when we uh, milled some roads in the city we had some millings left over and we just put millings over the top and, and basically made a basically a thin asphalt layer with millings and it was it was cost three so um but as time went on that went away and you know um councilman demon she, she's right i mean it's it's in bad shape you know there's some answers that we you know some fixes that we can do uh, without spending a lot of money um, to take care of it it will be a temporary but you know that can be accomplished uh, fairly easily and fairly inexpensively hey, Alan, one question when you turn like to go into the skate park that seems to be a different texture than the other area is it I, I, I don't I don't know yeah, there's a lime rock in the lime in the rock, okay. in where the soccer fields are, and then there was a milling. That That's milling was really was done the down there. So if we just scrape that off and then put down lime rock there, I think that would be 
probably a better solution than, than to try to pave it all because that's an expensive way to go. And to get into stormwater and things like that, but something needs to be done because there's big potholes throughout that whole area. Right, right. So we could, we could look at adding a temporary fix in the previous year for that prior to the 400000 in 1819. So that 400 in 1819 is the whole project there, this soccer, I'm calling it soccer yeah. parking. Yeah. And so we're paving the parking lot. The whole lot. parking lot where the dock, all that. Right. Okay. So. It's a lot. It's a big, that, that's actually a very large project, and it's pretty expensive. The, the other thing, too, is um, for, for fiscal year 14-15, um, aside from, um, and, and that's the other thing we should mention, is there's different funds, and those funds are, are assigned to, to the projects in, in the capital improvement program. Now, the capital assets fund can fund any capital program. We do have a stormwater utility fund, and the, by stormwater utility, I mean it's almost like an enterprise fund where basically the bill goes to the property owner and what comes back has to be spent on just stormwater, um, and, it's, and it basically is intended to survive on its own. So it's intended to pay for all of its expenses associated with that fund. And if you now that doesn't mean that capital assets or general fund couldn't pay for something in the stormwater fund, and actually it, it is now, <laughs> but um, what, you're, what we try to do is, is have that fund stand on its own as well as the capital assets fund. So the capital assets fund is, is when we prioritize these in here, you'll see, you know, like the 711,826, that's actually from the CRA to do A1A. Um, you'll see if you go down into the facilities, most of these items are provide are paid for by the capital assets fund, and the projects in 1415 are basically must do now, or they're going to cause us huge problems, financial problems later. So they're a have to do today type project. Councilman, you still have the. Uh, yeah, just one more question on the lighting uh, for the two of the four fields. <coughs> I don't see a page number on there. It's page two, I guess. Uh, 130 grand and 130 grand. Have have we had any contact with Musco or Musco about um, financing those lights rather than? No, we we actually we received one grant, so we did get one of the grants. Um, we applied for the we applied for a second one um, to be able to do that project, but then we'd have to come up with 50,000 for the project. Um, but we have not looked into financing that at all. The 50 of the 130 is, uh, our portion is 50 of right. the 130? Um, the first set of lights, because we have all the wiring to do, would be about 180. So the first field um, we're trying to get grants for, it's closer to 180. We've gotten a grant for 50. We're hoping to get a reapplication and get the other 50, and then maybe for it up the third 50, not sure. <clears throat> uh, but once we have all of the, the, the first field in light, the second and th the third field would be 130. Right. And Musco does have a, um, a program for um, um, financing it. It might not be a bad idea to look, look into the long-term financing through the lighting company. They also have um, a new program out using a monopole, which is um, like a um, financial windfall for the city. Um, because they put something on top of the pole and we get some money back. And um, we're setting up a meeting with um, Bob Dakuda from MESCO to learn a little bit more about that. And if I could just make a brief recommendation, too. For, for example, we have the, the field lighting, which is actually a new um, project, as well as the new DeSoto tennis courts funded later in fiscal year 18. Um, but the, fiscal, the field lighting we programmed in closer years because we did apply for grants. But if we don't get those grants, then we really can't do that project. And financing it, I would recommend against that, largely because if we were going to finance something, it would probably be something like the back truck building because the back truck is rusting and it needs, it needs to go into a building. So that would be a priority to take care of something we have now than to add something to our fleet of facilities and things that we have to take care of when we still need to take care of things that we have now. So that would be our recommendation is to, if we did finance something, um, to finance some, something to take care of a, a facility need that we have today. Which fields are these, Karen? The soccer fields at the sports park. Okay. 
if, um, if you're applying for grant funds for lighting, talking to you. If we're if we're um, applying for grant funds, does financing come into play? If we're paying for them outright, do we get grants? If we finance, do we not get grants? I mean, does that come into play at all? No. Okay. Okay. Um, at this time, hearing nothing from council, uh, open it up for public comments on this agenda item. Ron Jagudis, Resident Satellite Beach, CRA. <coughs> Excuse me. Council, city management, I have a problem. And that is that we have had changes here happen real quick in regards to what has been out to the citizens and what is now presented here tonight. And taxpayers here are going to become concerned this is wrong to present something after the fact if I am incorrect on this if this was not posted 24 hours prior then I think our policies and procedures have some issues here And my comments will be redacted from here. They do not count as far as the minutes are concerned. But to have this presented at the last minute to the citizens who pay taxes to this entity, not to see this change is wrong. I see stormwater fund going, swinging from $1.2 million to $400,000 in capital improvements. That's a huge amount. And then I hear about all these upgrades out here in regards to this. Uh, the changes and this and that, but what about, and I am a big proponent of real-time information, Windows 7 upgrade, and I'm diluting the comment here. This is absurd to bring this out so late. I have a problem with that, and I believe the citizens will have to. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Further comments from citizens? Rodney Smith, 265 South Robert Way. Good evening, uh, City Council members. Thanks for being here and donating or you know, volunteering your time for the community. I really appreciate it. I know it's hard for myself to get away from my family just to come in here for a few minutes and uh, I realize it's well I know it's a great paying job but <clears throat> uh, when it comes to uh, the budget and the procedures and the you know policy of uh, the timing of it I can't speak on that but I can uh, speak a little bit about the uh, stormwater fees and the roads and all the things that it takes to keep Satellite Beach the community that we, we, a lot of us started coming to 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I think the majority of the people that came to Satellite Beach are here for two reasons. Uh, it's either for the excellent quality of life we have, or it's for living on or near the water. I mean, 
you know, we're it's it's known we're one of the luckiest communities in the state. You know, great schools and uh, being between uh, the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian River Lagoon. It's reasonable to expect the citizens and government to be good stewards of our natural resources, especially when they're so directly connected to the value of our real estate investments and the health of our community. So when we spend money on things like stormwater runoff to improve it, to save a dying estuary, in fact, the most diverse species-wise estuary in the North American continent that's dying out, out here, that's good money spent. And especially when we can match it with grants because <laughs> it's coming down the road anyhow. We're going to have to spend money and continue to spend money, and we're not the only communities. I mean, there's not the only community out of many communities that are going to be spending this money. Uh, in fact, until we resolve the critical water problems plaguing our Indian River Lagoon, we will need to consider many significant investments and life ch lifestyle changes to help correct the problems we've created. And the we is, is just so many people, we're loving this place to death. There's so many of us here. The money that Satellite Beach invests today towards restoring clean air, a cleaner and healthier Indian River Lagoon will help reap many re rewards for us and for our future generations. So I suggest uh, spend the money now, particularly if you have a grant that you can match because you're going to spend the money down the road. You know? And I know the roads are looking, they're not great. I mean, obviously, we haven't spent much time and money on the roads recently. But hey, we'll just drive a little slower. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know? So, but it does all reflect on the value of our properties, and I think that's where a lot of people want to focus their attention on, protecting our investment. And the quality of life is really the, one of the biggest assets we have. So thank you for being thank here. Thank you very much. Laura, still open? Dale Abrams, resident of the CRA. Um, I'm a big supporter of the lagoon. I know we got issues with the lagoon. I would like to mention the fact that from the state and also from the feds, I believe um, Mr. Altman just procured about 40 million or 20 million, somewhere in that area for the lagoon. So I think that that's really important um, as far as that's concerned. Um, <clears throat> the other question I have is regarding the st stormwater fee. We know that Brevard County just raised their stormwater fee, and there was, you know, a lot of people that were not happy with that. My question is, is it earmarked specifically for stormwater? Okay. Um, that's just let me interrupt you, but that's our next agenda okay. item, and you, we, you will have. Your questions okay. will be answered in that pres in a presentation they're going to give. Um, regarding the capital improvement plans, obviously we weren't doing this in the past, and I think it's a very positive thing going forward. We do need to address this. The question is, where does the money come from? Okay. Um, I know that we have utilities that we can raise taxes on. Going forward, of course, there's always the millage rate. But we have to have the funding available in order to do these capital improvements. And we may have to do them in chunks, you know, in, in various times as far as the way you got it set up on your paperwork. Okay? But, you know, at the end of the day, the taxpayers are going to be paying for this. And I don't know how that will be analyzed for individual homeowner, homeowners going forward. Um, but I think some of the things that you have on here, I do agree, they do need to be addressed because obviously in the past they were not addressed. So now here we are. It's kind of like not taking care of your house and all of a sudden you got problems. Thank you very much. Um, further comments from the public? There are none. Back to council. Mr. Mayor. Oh. I'd like to correct a statement that's been made. Okay. Um, we've heard this before, uh, uh, and we've been chastised before. 
about not posting every bit of information that's going to appear in a council packet online. Both the Florida Attorney General and Florida courts have dealt with the issue of public notice. The only thing that we are required to post, according to Florida courts, is the time and place of a meeting. That's it. The Attorney General has added that you should also post an agenda if it's available. That's it. So we have no legal requirement to post these packets. <clears throat> and if anyone is aware of how hard and long this staff works to get the most complete and current information to us by the time a meeting starts, then they would understand that there are changes made at the last minute. My personal opinion is that the staff does a Herculean job of getting information ahead of time to the public uh, by means of our website. And according to Florida law, we are doing much, much more than is required of us. Thank you. Um, one comment on the numbers changing. This is a capital improvement program, and I, and I think on 625, these are our best estimates. Hopefully, we don't have a disaster or something immediately that we have a change, but this is a work, I think, in progress to me. It's a plan. And to me, I break it into needs and wants. I might want a lot on here, but I sure need a stormwater system that works if Glenwood trunk line, which is 40 or 50 years old, plus fails. And so therefore, this might change in a week or two if we had that disaster. So it's a plan. And, you know, things change on this all the time. If we get grants and we have the ability to do something, we need to take those grants, especially in the storm water system, because in roads, it's a major part of this. So to me, I use this as a work in progress to see close to what we are. In a lot of cases, we come in under a lot of these figures most of the time. So I know changes are always made to this and probably will be because of the needs will change over a period of five years. And, and if I could just add, when we, when we publish an agenda, we, have, we usually do that four or five days in advance of the meeting that we're having. <clears throat> and this is a workshop, so we provided the latest plan that we were recommending. In between that, we had comments from, you know, we have five different council members, six different department heads, community members call us and give them, give us their input and what they like and what they think that we should include. So sometimes those, in, those inputs change what we present to you and change our recommendations. And that, that's what basically happens. So this will probably change again by the time you get your proposed budget. And it'll probably change again by the time you adopt your budget. So it's not, the, the budget is a work in progress until you actually adopt it. And then even after that, you do budget amendments because you change it, because the budget is just that. It's a plan. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one comment. Yes. The only thing I would like to see is when there are changes or just what the changes are highlighted. Because it's... That's why I went through it with you. Yeah, no, I understand sure that, that, but you, knew that. you know, maybe mm -hmm. in red or a line through that if they've come off, because it, it is kind of hard to follow. Further comments from council? The only thing I'd like to add is that I think you kind of hit on it, Mr. Mayor, and I know Courtney hit on it as well. As well. This, the title of this meeting is a workshop, which means we don't take action on anything. We're looking over proposals, listening to presentations, and that sort of thing. So there's an enormous amount of latitude in a workshop as to what's brought forward. And that's so council and the citizens can work through the issue and move it forward to more of a, uh, more of a plan. So. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, uh, any further comments from council? Um, direction you need? I think I got, got a lot of your comments, unless okay. there was one that was made that nobody likes. So I'll, I'll go ahead and try to get all that. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thank you. If you have any further information or your thoughts you need to get, get to Courtney mm -hmm. on this matter. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item three. Discuss, make recommendation on the stormwater utility project and rate. Courtney. Uh, thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, the stormwater utility, we have a pretty big presentation for you this evening. Um, in, in a, it's actually, we thought we were going to concentrate more on capital improvements, and now we're actually going to be concentrating more on the stormwater utility um, because of not only the um, financial problems, but also the upcoming issues that we have to pay for in terms of water quality projects. So we are going to divide this presentation up so you don't get bored with my voice <laughs> and allow Alan to start. He's going to give you an overview of the existing um, stormwater utilities infrastructure, and then we'll start talking about some of the rates and the uh, rate structure and and then go through some of the issues with uh, water quality improvements and then our recommendations for the rate structure. Test, test, test. Can you hear me? Okay, good evening. Uh, tonight we're going to um, talk about the Stormwater Utility Fund and um, basically I'm going to give you the nuts and bolts of what we do as far as stormwater and a little background into the stormwater um, system. Um, and um, Courtney will give you the other part of it, the financial side of it, because um, she can explain that better than I can. So let's, um, next slide please. Basically um, our existing um, infrastructure pipe alone there's about 17.3 miles of pipe um, in the in the system. Um, I would say 60% of that is over 50 years old, and of various, of course, various sizes, various types. The corrugated metal pipe and the corrugated aluminum pipe are are in dire need of attention in in um, uh, different parts of the city. Um, it's an old technology and being uh, exposed to salt water and sand for over 50 years is not, uh, is not the greatest uh, environment for that type of pipe. Next slide, please. Um, along with the, um, the pipe, we also have the infrastructure, which is the, the inlets, um, the inlet baskets, which are new. Um, when the, um, the newer systems that we put in along Jamaica, um, Ocean Spray, Greenway, they all have inlet baskets that will catch uh, vegetative debris, cans, cups, things like that to keep them from going into the system, clogging the system and ultimately reaching the lagoon. Um, those are cleaned out. We can clean those out either manually or with the back truck. Uh, we have 10 baffle boxes in the city, four of which are what they call first generation baffle boxes. I'll get into that a little bit later in the program, but um, basically what they are are a couple of chambers, water comes in one chamber, rises, the um, solids settle out, goes into another chamber, the, you know, the remaining solids settle out, and then it rises again and releasing clean water basically down the line into the lagoon. Um, that does not catch any vegetative debris, so um, what they found was it was basically making tea with the vegetative debris that it was collecting and the nutrients were continuing down through the system. Um, and of course, we do have um, gutters, which are basically the, the conveyance system for the stormwater in, in many areas of the city. There are also many areas that do not have gutters, and if you live in the uh, wood section of the, um, the city, I'm talking green, green um, Norwood, Glenwood, that area, there aren't any um, gutters there and the east side of those streets, the east end of the, ci the city, with, uh, that area, um, driveways tend to collect water because there aren't any gutters to move the water so it goes to the lowest spot it can as it moves down and so if you live in those areas you know what I'm talking about. And they all need regular cleaning so um, all those structures is part of what we do. We did get a back truck with the Cassia Phase Two grant um, that was part of our match. The cost of that truck was uh, $267,033. It's a very, very neat piece of equipment. Um, 
we, we clean out baffle boxes, we clean out the inlet box, we clean pipes, we've repaired pipes, we've, and I meant to bring um, Spider-Man and the football, but I forgot that, them, to bring them tonight, but we actually pulled a Spider-Man, he's about this tall and about that wide, and a football out of a, a pipe um, and that was inundated with roots from a giant oak tree. We took the root cutter that we purchased, um, cut the roots out, and when the roots came, so did Spider-Man and the football. So uh, we solved a, uh, what was a very bad um, water backup problem with the root cutter cutting down a tree and giving um, Spider-Man and the football a new place to hang out, namely my office. So, um, but the back truck is rusting. I mean, we've had that back truck for a couple of years now, and it's been outside. We've moved it around a few places, and um, we had it behind the shop, and the, the guy that lives behind us said it was killing his trees, so we moved it. And we put it out in the front. We were going to put it out here, but there's no protection for it. So it sits in our parking lot now, and it really needs to be inside. There's, we've already had to fix some, some rusting issues. There's a big um, hard plastic pipe that's on top that actually is the big vacuum, and it's dry rotting. So, you know, that soon is going to have to be replaced at a cost of a couple thousand dollars because we can't, we can't put it inside. And it's just the sun is just tearing it up. Um, we also have a, a high vol um, volume or six inch trailer mounted pump that we've used for quite a while. We got that um, probably 15, 20 years ago, and that was with a grant, and that has definitely helped us in some flooding situations. A big time um, down uh, behind uh, Sun on the Beach in that area, we were able to move a lot of water with that pump. And if anybody's been around for a while, they know that when we get some heavy rains, that area is, gets, is very, um, uh, floods very easily, so. Next slide, please. Okay, I, you can't really see this picture well, but that is one of our employees. He's in somebody's side yard. He's fixing a 24-inch concrete pipe that has a hole in it in between two houses. That person lost a lot of plants. They, we had to move a bunch of stepping stones and, and things like that to get in there to fix that pipe because that pipe runs through their yard. Um, but that's one of the things that we do and I'll talk about later how, you know, how we could fix that with, with little, um, little um, disruption to the lives of the folks that live there. But um, that's part of what we do and, and, you know, we pay two people a year basically out of the stormwater utility to take care of all these issues. Um, the materials and supplies, we, we budget a meager $20,000 a year because that's all we have to, to take care of that. And then, of course, the quarterly street sweeping, um, that is with our waste management contract, and that is a requirement through the um, NPDES, and uh, we get credit through FDEP towards our TMDLs for the street sweeping. So um, forward, please. Thank you. Um, and the, the, our engineer has, has estimated our, the value of our system, total system now at 22.8 million. And the useful life, service life, is between 50 and 100 years. I would say that that's very accurate. I would, you know, right now, I've been here for 27 years and there's a lot of pipe there that we've not touched, but we know that there's problems. Um, and there's a lot of pipe that we have touched that we know that there's problems. So, um, and the pipe's been here well before I was here. So I would, I would put it at around 75 years, especially the concrete pipe. Um, and in that, you know, you should be putting away at least 2% of the value um, per year for the, the, the O and M, the operations and maintenance, and the, um, the repair and replacement of that, that system. Um, and it's either 1% or 2%, depending on what the life of the system is. We're, ours is about 75 years, so you see the 1.33 there. 
And then again, we have the, the VAC truck and um, our utility equipment. The, the value is around 300000 That's the big stuff. Um, we have smaller stuff, but that's not nearly the big, the big ticket items. Um, and, of course, you see the, the number there. So. Okay, um, the, the most pressing needs, as I said before, are the steel and the aluminum piping. Uh, a, confer a conservative estimate to replace that piping would be $150 a foot, and if we replaced it all, it, you know, it would be about $1.5 million, $1.6 million to, to replace it all. Slip lining is the technology that they're using a lot now, especially in sewer, where they, they take a, um, basically a, almost a balloon and they pull it through the pipe and they blow it up and it hardens and that becomes the new pipe and it is basically a brand new pipe inside a pipe. So it, it's a great technology. We've used it. We used it once on the Cassia Phase Two project where we went through um, folks' yards from Greenway over to uh, behind the church on Cassia. Oceanside, isn't that what that is now? Oceanside Evangelical? Back there, um, and it was, I think, $113 a foot to, to do a 24-inch pipe. So that cost goes up. I roughly worked out the cost to do the entire Lori Lane trunk with a slip line. That's a 30-inch pipe, and that was $524,000. That's about $138 a foot. But that also includes the cleaning of the pipe and derooting of the pipe. But it does not include any water quality work at all. You see here, that pipe is, was on Chevy Chase. That's an 18-inch corrugated metal pipe. And you can see how rotted away it is. Um, and that's what we face a lot when we go into, into folks' yards that have this type pipe um, in their yards. And there's, there's a few areas in the city where you, can, you would definitely see that, that there's problems. And then, of course, we have um, damaged inlet tops all over the city, waste management. Um, and I can't say that with any certainty. I don't, if I don't see it, I can't say it. But I have a good idea that it's one of them big trucks that runs over my inlet tops and breaks, breaks them at a cost to repair of about $2,800 per. Um, what I, the, the ultimate goal is to replace them with the, um, the the type of inlets that are now on Jamaica Boulevard, the sunken grate types that we put in on Jamaica, on um, Greenway, on Ocean Spray, and some of them along Kale Temple and, and Thyme. Um, those are the, the desired type because we can put baskets in there too for water, water treatment. But those are $9,000 a piece, so those aren't, you know, Real easy to do. Okay, so I think here I will turn this over to Courtney. Thank you. Could we ask questions to Alan before, or do you want them all at the end? No, I would go ahead and split them up because it is a long. So you're, if, if I'm right, over 60% is 50 years or older? <coughs> yes. Okay. Um, is Glenwood our worst problem or cover, let me put it this way, does it cover the largest volume of water? of what system that needs to be repaired? I would say, yeah, I think that's probably accurate. Would you say that, Dave? Yes, we, you know, we, we took care of the North Drainage Basin, we took care of the Cassia Basin, so uh, the Minnesota Basin didn't take care of a few years ago. Sorry, David King, Clinton Hampton. Um, yes, with the work that we've done over the past years on the North Drainage Basin, the Cassia Basin, the DeSoto Basin, um, I'd say we, we took some of, took care of those larger pipes. Um, the, the Glenwood area is the, is the next largest pipe, uh, largest basin in the city that's yet to be dealt with. Okay. So what I see is we have kind of two issues. We have existing that's 60 years old that needs to be replaced. And then we're always going to have an ongoing fee to maintain this. System. Absolutely. Is the slip lining of Glenwood um, solving a problem of some of that 60%? It's solving the problem of the, of the 
of the flow um, because of root infiltration. You know, we're losing a lot of, you know, flow volume be or velocity because of the roots and, and things that the roots catch in the system, like Spider-Man. <laughs> so um, it would help to slip line, but it doesn't help with any treatment at all. But I think slip lining would would solve some of the issues. Yes. How do we? Is there a, is there technology out there that allows for us to do some type of treatments with that line after it's slipped? In place, no. You would you have to do something on either end of the pipe before it got in, the water got in the pipe or before it discharged to the outfall. Um, the slip lining. Uh, it, it, it's a very good technique, um, especially when you don't have access um, to the pipe, such as this trunk line, and also when it's underneath uh, expensive things to repair, such as pavement and landscaping and stuff like that. So, uh, um, but it by itself doesn't provide any water quality treatment. But this would be the recommended fix for the Glenwood trunk is to slip line it. It's the most effective cost-wise. I would I I say that's pretty accurate. But again, we're not getting any treatment. Um, I think we do a third of the pipe for a million plus what we get treatment with that. So um, to do the entire slip line, the entire pipe, yeah, I, I think that would, you get more bang for your buck that way. Yeah. If if, the, if that line goes, it goes through the yards. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it goes it goes from like um, Magnolia West. No, it goes from Temple. Temple West. Temple West to um, the Lori Lane parking lot. Is there is there um, is there technology out there that when we get to the streets that are crossing it, like Kale, Temple, you know, Thine, can we do treatment in those areas in between the slip line that'll at least solve some of the TMDL issues that are going to end up ultimately coming out on the other end. Well, the plan was with the Lori Lane project was to treat the water that's getting to the trunk line so that it's treated before it gets to the trunk line. Okay. So, you know, if the technologies are now such that we don't know, especially in line, what's working. So if we can exfiltrate, which was the plan for Lori Lane with a a material that would denitrify the, the water as it's being perked out, then, yeah, you'd get treatment then before then. And that's what the Lori Lane project was set up to do, initially, you know, in its design. Um, but as you move down closer to the river, of course, the water table rises, and you don't have the opportunity for that. So you'll have to find another technique to treat the water somehow, some way, that doesn't involve groundwater. I, yeah, we've on um, past projects been able to leverage. We've been ha handling conveyance um, improvements and also doing those uh, water quality improvements. And so we, some of the slip lining pipe, replacing pipe, enlarging pipe to move that water along faster, and then along either along the way or at certain points to provide some uh, BMP, some best management practices for uh, treating that water. And yes, where it comes back into the city on the right of ways or, or where you have the opportunities to do something, because it takes space or room or land or mm -hmm. something else to uh, um, to construct those BMP. So that would be the part of the, the plan. It would be best to have that as part of the plan no matter which way you went, whether it be slip lining or replacing. Right. Okay. Uh, Alan, I'm just thinking back. When we bought that uh, vac truck, didn't we have a place designated to put that thing inside when we bought it? No. Did not? No, we we had planned to build something out back here. Okay. And then the bubble burst. So I remember something. <laughs> so that, that plan changed pretty quickly. Okay. Second question is, 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 there, is there any place where we can put the thing? Uh, maybe, maybe not physically in the city of Satellite Beach, but rent a space someplace to get it off the... Well, actually, there's no place close that it would make it feasible to to put it inside that I know of. We were actually talking to Cocoa Beach before Chuck Billius left mm -hmm. about doing a joint yeah, a venture up at the um, the old South Housing area because they have a lift station up there that they wanted to build a building next to, and we were going to be able to put it up there. Well, Chuck left, things changed, and that went away. So. Um, and we've explored the 
the possibility of maybe putting it at the fire department. Yeah. But the problem there is that it would have to be taken out, put back, taken out every day, and you're still not changing the exposure to the sun, the salt air, and, you know, it's just getting in, you know, it's making a, it's a logistical issue. Yeah, I just couldn't remember all those issues. Thank you. That's, that's fine. You're welcome. <coughs> Alan, my recollection is that we went after that back truck grant twice. We didn't get it the first time, and we did the second time. And on one of those grant arrangements, uh, we were partnering with Indian Harbor Beach. Are are we sharing that truck with them? No. Okay. No. That must have been the way. I have had discussions with other cities that wanted to um, wanted to use our services and tried to you know figure out a cost for that, but. You know, I I have a hard time sending guys out of the city to do work when I can't get them. To, you know, can't don't have enough time to do work in our city. So. But we are meeting with the Indian Harbor Beach coming up in the next week or so um, to talk about potential partnerships, and maybe that might be something we can discuss. They're slip lining a lot of their streets right now. They have well, cruising. they have crews in Indian Harbor Beach now. They're slip lining a lot of that area. I think it's on Banana River Drive or. Pine tree, one of those but I think that's Brevard County. Brevard County. Mm -hmm. They've been in the city doing doing them too. Sewer the gravity sewer, mm -hmm. the sanitary sewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The slip line knocks out the treatment as we were planning without the slip line. So I don't want to you know pull this now, but so the TML TMDLs and the B maps. So I heard they don't work. That the information that we're finding. We're going to get to that. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get right, to that. I'll hold it. Okay. Sorry. I have a couple questions. What year was the back truck purchased? Do you remember? The back truck was purchased in 2011. No. No, way. no, 2004. no, no yeah. It was before I, then. I went to, I went to Ohio to, to, to buy it. I, it was in 2000, <laughs> 2011. Really? Yeah. Can we check on that? I don't think it was, it's all that. And where, where do we plan to build up this storage building? <coughs> well, I, the, the spot that I was thinking was down at DeSoto next to the racquetball courts to build something down in that area. That way it's kind of out of the way and it's not, you know. Okay. And then just a couple questions. We talked about 17.3 miles of pipe and 50 miles of gutters. That doesn't include A1A or South Patrick Drive, correct? That's just the interior. Safe. Correct. Yeah, no, that's just city-owned okay. pipes. And, and then how often pipes. do you cycle around and uh, clean out the inlets and use the back truck? And do you keep a, a log? Yeah, we have a log. We have we keep um, a log of all that because we have to for DEP. And we try to do everything quarterly, and that's dependent upon, you know, staff and what's, at, what's going on at the time and how we fit it into our schedule, you know, because we only have two guys that, that do all that, you know, so... Okay. And then the um, street sweeping is a contract, correct? And they do that twice yeah, a year? That's with, uh, through the waste management okay. franchise. All right, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Pardon? Okay, um, this is the, the existing utility funds. Basically, we have 5,000 contributors to, that are billed for the utility. Our current rate is $65 per ERU, and an ERU is, is, stands for equivalent residential unit. So basically, a single-family home in Satellite Beach pays $65 a year towards the stormwater uh, fund. The revenue we receive uh, uh, is approximately $325,000 a year. And I put this picture of the flooding here because that, when, when we talk about stormwater, particularly when we created the utility, that's what we created it for. It was basically for flood attenuation, drainage projects, basically moving the water. And since that time, we have really changed our view of stormwater from just flood attenuation to water quality. So now we're looking at it from a more environmental standpoint of trying to clean the water before it gets into our major water bodies like the Indian River Lagoon. So now we are looking at, in, in addition to just drainage projects and maintaining our infrastructure, to also adding new components to our system to treat the, qu the quality of the water prior to it reaching the Indian River Lagoon. 
This is a history of our rate increases. We created the, the uh, utility in 1997 at $36 per ERU. And since then, it's increased to 2009. We did an increase in 2006, 2008, and 2009. Since then, we have not done a rate increase. Um, so the last time that we increased the rates, um, we still had not received our TMDL mandate. We, we, we knew what we were um, going to look at, we, what we were looking at from a TMDL standpoint in about 2010 and 2011. And I'll get to the TMDLs later on in the presentation. This is our current utility revenue versus the debt service. Um, before we go on into the debt service issue, we, we wanted to I wanted to just clarify that, that all the debt service that we have listed here, this is the debt service payments, were all taken out to complete water quality projects that went to our first five year TMDL requirement. So basically this coming year after the debt service is paid, we only have $13,465 for operations and maintenance, replacement and renewal, and new projects. That certainly gets better by 2021. Um, however, in fiscal year 17-18, we will have new TMDL requirements to, to start back up again. So if you go to the next slide, this is our existing utility revenue versus operation maintenance and renewal and replacement. So basically right now, um, in the previous, in your agenda packet, what, what we gave you is that 102,000 is what we transfer from the utility, basically what we spend right now um, from the utility on operations and maintenance. So that's what's transferred into the Public Works Department to pay for two employees. Um, currently, the general fund is paying for the street sweeping. So that's not, that's always been paid for by general fund. So historically, the stormwater fund really hasn't. Excuse me. Um, the noise from the back, we can hear it up here, so I know it has to be loud for the, the general public. Um, I would appreciate it if we wait for comments at the end. Thank you. Sorry, Colonel. Okay. So basically, the stormwater utility has never really stood on its own. So the general fund's always kind of been supplementing that. Um, but right now, we, when, when we take out the um, net available in 1415, which is only 13,000, and begin subtracting, you know, the operation and maintenance, ba basically the general fund now is carrying the stormwater utility by $105,531. And that gets better next year with 40722 largely because you'll see some debt service coming off the, the table, okay? In the, none of these scenarios for the next two years are we doing anything for re renewal and replacement because there's just no money to do that. Um, it's not until you get into 2021 do you see any substantial funds for renewal and replacement. So we have gaps right now in the utility funding situation. We cannot cover routine operation and maintenance for 14-15 or, or fiscal year 15-16, and general fund is covering these costs. Replacement and slip lining of pipe is needed to prevent flooding, um, and that, that basically banking that money will take approximately two decades in the current situation. And our current funding level does not address equipment replacement, nor does it address inflation. Okay. And this is an example. All the pictures that we have in this presentation are examples of pipe that are in, within the city of Satellite Beach. It's not pictures from anywhere else. So basically right now, we are, um, our utility, in talking about what we're, what we're needing in terms of operation and maintenance and replacement renewal, is only talking about main, maintaining the flood control service level at status quo. And that's to be cleaning filter baskets, inlets, and pipes as required to avoid flooding. And it, basically, we're not dealing with any water quality issues with this funding scenario. We do have a street sweeping contract that is a water quality program, um, and that's pretty much all we're doing right now, other than the current the water quality projects that we have done. It does not fully support our operation and maintenance of the existing water quality improvements that we've done, and we have. Um, any in, ser any in service improvements that we're doing um, are all incidental to replacement. So basically, um, we will do um, flood control and basically prior to doing any water quality projects because that's pretty much what we have to do, okay? Um, 
Um, the water quality programs, I don't know, do you want to start this? I'm going to give this back to Alan so he can explain the BMAP process. Can I ask, can we have a sure. ask a couple questions? Um, on the rate increases over time, mm -hmm. um, has cost of living ever been added into them? No, we don't have a cost of living adjustment added, that, like an automatic adjustment. We do in like other contracts, like waste management has that, um, but we do not have that for this one utility. Okay, so basically when we made these adjustments, we didn't take into consideration the duration of time that would have just dollars would have occurred by, you know, increase the cost of living. Right. Okay. But there's a different, we use a different cost adjustment for public infrastructure projects, and it's to generally not the cost of living okay. uh, increase, but we can, when we get, if, we, if that's something you want us to look at to build into the, into the rates, we can do that, and, and we'll explain that, that cost adjustment. It's different for infrastructure because the, um, it's just on a different level. I think you recall back when we were, when we had the bubble, if you will, the cost of construction skyrocketed, and that was at a different level and rate than anything else. Right. And again, I'm not in saying to do it or not do right. it. I was just more for information. Any other questions for? Yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit about what were some of the items that created the debt service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through that. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're we're oh, is that coming yeah. up? That's coming up. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now we get into the unfunded mandate area. Um, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System um, is the Fed program to clean um, water that was developed in the 1970s, um, and that is administered through the uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Um, there are a lot. We are audited every two years. We have a, a permit that allows us to discharge into the um, the into basically into the national waters um, or the waters of the state. Um, and we have mandates that allow us to do that as long as we follow their rules. And so the um, annual inspections and maintenance, they take time and they're becoming progressively more restrictive. Um, they you definitely have to keep good records because if you don't, they will want to see, well, they'll ask you why you don't, and uh, they, they could be stiff, stiff penalties, stiff fines. But that primarily drives your O&M because you have to show that you're maintaining your system and you're doing training. Uh, training's a big one. Education's a big one. Um, so that's on the national level. Now, on the local level or the, the state level, the Basin Management Action Plan or the BMAPs, we've been working on since around 2008. And those are basically the, what sets the TMDLs or the nutrient criteria that um, we have to reduce our, um, our input into the lagoon by a certain amount um, of, or nutrient reduction by a certain amount. So that is why we have to do these, new, these water quality projects. Tongue tied. Mm -hmm. next, next slide. Okay, so here we go. The total maximum daily loads, or the TMDLs, they were established um, by the FDEP, and they were um, established using 1990s data, a model that was developed, and it was not developed for that purpose. It was developed for something totally different uh, to monitor seagrass, I do believe. Is that correct, John? St. John's developed what they call PLURS, Pollution Load Reduction Goals. It was when they were first getting interested in the lagoon and they wanted some number to give them an idea what would it take to clean up the lagoon. So it was a goal. It was out there. It wasn't mandated. It was just, this is where we'd like to get if we could. And so using those numbers, Satellite Beach was hit with the goals of reducing nitrogen by 63% and reducing phosphorus by 60%. That's an awful lot. And that's, that's like 
let me just get into this. Five, <laughs> um, the first few five years of the of the BMAP, we were um, tasked with reducing that number by 15 percent. So all of the projects that we've done, we 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 did hit that target. We reduced and, and made the 15 percent the first five year iteration of the BMAP, um, and we have five years to start doing more. The problem is, the more is 85 percent. We spent, and you'll see it in, in the following slides, overall we spent 5.8 million dollars getting to 15 percent of the goals that they said we have to attain. In the Banana River, we have met that target for the 15 percent. All of the entities that, that touch the Banana River, they we've met our goal. But, and we don't have to really do anything until 2018. But if you wait until 2018, then you're under the gun to do 42.5 percent of what your, what your, your target is then. Next slide. Here's the projects that we've done to hit the, the, the marks. Now, if you look down at the bottom, all the money that we spend, we still don't get to our 15 percent goal. So we needed something else. Next slide. So now they have what they call soft credits. So for education, for a, for a fertilizer ordinance, and for the Jamaica ponds, we reuse the water in the, in the ponds in Jamaica to water our, our ball fields and our soccer fields, and we get credit for that because we're pulling out of those ponds. But that may not be for long, so because of the new science, so we'll see. Anyway, <coughs> so we spent five point eight million dollars, and we reduced our. We made almost made our goal, but then we added the programs, and we did make we made the goal. So we're good for the next fifteen or next first five years, but. Those numbers do not include operations and maintenance or any other projects that we needed to do for any other systems in the city that, that need attention. You know, renewal or um, repair, replacement of other, other systems in the city. So we've broken it down to cost per pound of reduction per project. And the, the cheapest project that we had was the Jamaica ponds because we had the land available to build the ponds. If we didn't have the land available, of course, that would have driven the cost up, but we, that was, it was there for us. But as you see, um, Jackson Avenue, cost per pound of, of uh, nitrogen was $16,000, and for phosphorus was $46,000 per pound. Of course, that's old technology, old um, best management practices, but at the time, the TMDLs weren't in existence. We did the reductions that we were required to do for those projects to get that money, and that's what we, that's how we levied the, the project, um, and that was basically a storm drain or a flooding issue uh, project that we did do treatment with. Next slide. Okay, so the um, street sweeping gains us 79, what is it, $79 a pound. John, I think you can explain this a little bit better than me because this slide. Well, again, if you go back we pay $19,800 a year to remove a given number of pounds. You divide the number of pounds, or the, the dollars by the pounds, and it gives you the cost per pound. And the point here is the programs, the soft credits, are cheap. If we could do more, if we could sweep every day instead of every quarter, if we could have education every afternoon and get credit for it, we do it. But we have used up all our soft credits. 
The education is basically, if you do a minimum amount, you get a certain number of credits. If you do 10 times that, there's no change in the credits. I can hear him. He's still working. Next slide. So I'll, let you, I'll let you continue explaining this because this you can, you can speak scientists better than I can. Okay. We showed how many pounds we've gotten credit for. We showed how many pounds we've been told we were going to have to remove by the end of the 15-year period. All you need to do is subtract the two numbers. It tells you we've got this, these number of pounds, 8,000 pounds of nitrogen, 1,400 pounds of phosphate. Using the average cost for the projects, like I said, we don't have any more programs we can do. And those projects included the Cassia or the uh, Jamaica, which we're not going to duplicate that one. The only way we would get the land would be tear down buildings, and that gets extremely expensive. It also has tax base implications. Uh, so if you take the average cost per pound for the projects, for nitrogen it comes out to $34 million, for phosphorus it comes out to $24 million. But a project takes care of both at the same time, so you don't add the two together. Okay, so obviously the long pole in the tent is nitrogen, so that's the one we use. And if you take, again, the average of about 5,000 taxpayers divided into $34 million, comes out to almost $7,000. And you take that, divide it over the 15-year BMAT period, and it comes out to $455 per year per taxpayer over those 15 years in addition to whatever you are paying today. And please note the note in parentheses. This is not proposed. We really don't need to see this in Florida today, that Satellite Beach is going to charge $455 a year. It gets more complicated. Exfiltration and baffle boxes are no longer accepted the way we built them. In fact, the Lurie Lane project ran smack into that, and you'll hear about that in a bit. Uh, as such, you can expect that average cost to be on the low side, perhaps quite a bit low. And again, this does not include the O&M, the R&R that's associated with all these new projects. You figure you put $34 million in the ground, it's going to cost a lot of money to operate it and then to replace it, even on a 100-year life cycle. And it doesn't count inflation. Does anybody have questions on that part before we start into the rate structure that we're recommending? Yeah, I do. On page 8, you talked about the targets, satellite beach reduction target, targets. They're just targets, correct? No. They are by rule, and we are to meet them. That's what they say right now. Obviously, uh, there's quite a while to go on those 15 years, so we don't know where it's going to go, but that's part of what we're going to discuss. I have a question. You know, John mentioned land. And, you know, are we, in a, are we in any position where we can look at um, opportunities that are adjacent to the city for property, um, one being school board property at Satellite Delora area, to offset some of the issues in that part of the city. I know we talked at one point in time with property at, you know, Patrick, mm -hmm. the Patrick uh, area up there where we have an agreement with Hunt Pinnacle. I mean, if there are some areas that we can, because ultimately there's going to be some building going on there, and I think we have to 
to look outside the box because we can't just discount that the land's not there. It's there. We just have to figure out how to utilize it where it's going to benefit both of us. They're going to build there. The school board is going to be doing things. They may not be doing things. Um, but, I mean, there's property there that we can probably partner with because they're creating some of this problem. It's not just Satellite Beach that's creating the problem. So I'd, I'd say we need to at least explore those options, too. The school board has always been very receptive to partnering with cities on, especially if we have an infrastructure project that we need to do. So, you know, that's, that's a great suggestion, and we can always look into seeing if they have areas in their, on their property I mean, that they're just not going to use. I mean, we have school over here. We have, I mean, right. there's, there's opportunities that are there. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Um, at this time, it's 8.15, um, requested by some council members. We're going to take a 10-minute recess. <laughs> Based on the impact that you had and a condo, you know, they had the same and you picked up a condo unit. Yeah, no. School car on top of the drive on our streets. It's based on the, yeah. <laughs> Reconvene their workshop. Um, Courtney? Good. So I'm going to go through the, you know, where we stand in terms of our rates with other um, utilities in the county as well as the state, and then go through some of the issues that we are having um, with our water quality improvement efforts, um, and then how we're recommending to structure our rate um, this coming year. The, our current rate is $65 per ERU, an ERU in our city is defined as 3,000 square feet. So basically every residence in our, every single family home in our city pays $65. Um, however, commercial, industrial, and other land uses, um, we have formulas that are based on impervious surface that, that's different. You'll see how that's factored in, in a slide that we gave an example of. Um, so Brevard County, for example, has the same rate. They just changed theirs to, to increase. They increased theirs to $65 per ERU. But their ERU is 2,500 square feet. Um, the statewide average is $68.16 um, per ERU, and the ERU square footage is 3,047 square feet. Um, Titusville is the, one of the highest at $79.44. Uh, Seventy-nine dollars and forty-four cents, and then um, three thousand and three hundred square feet is the ERU size. Um, in Brevard, of the eight Brevard county governments, um, the four that we provided exceed Satellite Beach's rate. Um, so, next slide. In the statewide average, you'll see um, some of the higher ones that we provided here. Forty percent of the eighty-eight reporting governments exceed the average. By the way, um, but the uh, some examples that we wanted to provide, for example, Winter Park, which is um, actually not connected to like an Indian River Lagoon, <laughs> um, still charges one, $138.72 per ERU, and their square feet um, ERU number is 2,324. And then you get to a place like Clearwater, which is very high, as their square foot ERU is much lower. You go to the next slide. Now, ERUs. Um, to even that out, we divided it just by the rate by 1,000 square feet so you could see where everybody stands. So we tried to kind of equalize the rates um, by equalizing the, the square footage of the ERU. And so you could see Satellite Beaches um, actually turns out to be one of the lower ones. Um, and then you'll see Titusville actually um, turns out to actually kind of lower because their, their square footage of their ERU was lower. Go to the next slide. Um, so that's basically where we stand in terms of our rate structure and, and how we compare to some of the other areas. And uh, although I, we, we always like to know that information, um, I really honestly dislike presenting it because every city has different problems and every city has different TMDL requirements. Every city has different infrastructure requirements and infrastructure needs. Um, so their rates are based on what their needs are, and that's what you really should be basing your rates on is your needs, not where everybody else is. So um, in terms of water quality improvement efforts, 
Um, some of the technical issues that we're running into is that our favorite best management practices have been found to be less effective than belief. So, for example, um, the trash, we've had to add trash racks added to the baffle boxes, and we've needed to treat, we need to treat the water before the exfiltration. So, for example, we've put in exfiltration projects. Did you want to do? Say well, I can explain okay. it. Um, just that um, we did, we've done exfiltration projects in the past without treating them the, in the manner that we're, we're talking about doing with the Lori Lane project with the um, uh, denitrification material. And, you know, now that there's discussion in Tallahassee um, that that may not be the best way to go because of science that has come up since the, um, since we put together what we call a dream team of experts to give a little pushback in, on the science that was used to develop the TMDLs. Um, so, you know, so now in order to exfiltrate, you have to, like we were saying, wrap the exfiltration with some type of denitrification material, um, this bold and gold material um, that uh, Dr. Marty Wanalista at the University of Central Florida developed back in 2006, 2005. Um, it's, it's basically ground up tires and it's carbon, and the carbon develops bacteria that eats the nitrogen, and it's fairly inexpensive in a, in a way to treat, but during our last BMAP meeting, we talked to Tallahassee about that, and they didn't even have the credits quantified to be able to use this, although it's been around since, 19, and since 2006 or, or longer. So that's the issues that we're running into as far as um, where we're going in uh, future projects. Sorry. And let me um, give them a background real quick. When, when the TMDL model was proposed by FDEP, all of the local governments in Brevard County got together and hired a consulting firm, a group of consultants basically, we called it the Dream Team, to come up with a better model because we felt that the model they were using was so old and outdated that we hired this new consultant to do a better model, which has been turned into FDEP, just it has not been reviewed, and it's been about a year and a half since that's been turned into them. So that is one of our issues is that they, they go through that and, and review that. And this, the second thing is, is that um, during the, this Dream Team provided data to FDEP that showed that even though we're doing all these projects, nutrients are still going into the river through groundwater which means all the, the idea that we provide retention ponds and exfiltration is that you treat the water before it gets into the groundwater, and what's happening is it's not working as well as we thought it would. So that's what's happening. So now we're trying to look at new technologies to make that better. So that's, that's the reason why we're wanting them, to FDEP, to provide crediting for things like the bold and gold material, and they have not gotten to that point yet because there's no data to support what credit, the credit should be. So our point to DEP is, and this is what I say we, I mean the stakeholders of all the local governments in Brevard County, that they need to stop requiring us to do their research and development for their credentialing <laughs> and come up with a better way to provide credits to local governments that are investing in new technologies when data is not available yet. So that's, that's the background of that. And to support what Courtney's saying, um, you know, prior to the, the, the blooms in 2011 and 2012, there were um, studies done with the seagrass that showed vast improvement in all areas of the lagoon. Mm -hmm. The seagrasses were coming back. According to, the, to the, um, the transects that they were taking and the science that they were seeing, the super blooms that created um, – uh, turbidity in the water and, and uh, low oxygen and all the things that, that will kill plants, kill plants. So they were trying to figure out now what caused the bloom. Well, we've done all these projects since 2000, reduced our amount of runoff into the water. That everything was going great and then boom, we have this bloom. Well, what caused the bloom? So now we're back to the beginning. One of the, one of the um, ideas is the, what they call legacy load. And that is the, the muck 
that is in the canals that's built up over the 50 years that these canals have been built, 50 or 60 years that they've been in existence. You know, when people were cutting their grass and, and all, all of the, the vegetative debris and the dead fish and all, everything that went into and died in the, in the canals or in the lagoon all kind of settled out. And now we have, in some areas, what, John, seven, eight feet of muck, seven, eight feet deep of muck. There's a pit south of the Pineta that has more than 30 feet. I didn't have anything to hit the bottom. So when, and when you have storms, this is reanimated. You know, the, the turbulence in the water reanimates this muck, and it, re, and it opens up the, 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 nutrient, um, the nutrient load in the muck, and it, it just spreads it around again. So it makes it worse. Then you couple that with the freeze that we had in 2010, which we had a lot of die off of, of um, animal life and vegetative life, and those things dying and sinking to the bottom and decaying did not help the nutrient load get any better because all it did was add to it. So, you know, we don't know exactly what caused these blooms, but they didn't help the situation. And what we're doing, all the projects we're doing is helping, was helping the lagoon until this happened. So now they're going back to what's causing the blooms. So until they figure that out, then we're still treading water, basically. So the, the TMDL model that they used did not even talk about groundwater. It talked about surface runoff. And the numbers that they used for the island were skewed because Satellite Beach is different from Melbourne because we know we live on sand. So if we get rain, a good portion of that first rain is going to soak into the ground. It's not going to run off. Well, we, they had our soil types wrong. They had our land use wrong. So this dream team went back and reworked all of that science and, and all of those, those um, components and came up with a new model. And so that's where we're at now, waiting to see where we're at with the, the treatment methods that they're going to come up with. Because the treatment methods that we're using, obviously, they think, well, they know aren't working. Is that correct in my, in my description? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. That uh, Well, you figure, if you recall, <clears throat> The TNDLs that by rule have been applied, levied on, on satellite beach were minus 10,000 pounds and whatever the other number, minus 63% and minus 60%. Well, if half the water is going in the base flow underground, we have access to only half the water. And therefore, the, what we have been doing doesn't touch everything it gets very complicated, and the uh, the last bullet here probably is the uh, uh, the real kicker. Uh, when they looked at the models, when they tried to reproduce what the folks had done that built the model that the TNDL is based on, when they finally were able to replicate the results. They found that, and it's statistically very challenging, uh, what they found was that what the original modelers had decided was a correlation between nutrients and seagrass. More nutrients, less seagrass, basically is what they said. That when you really look at the data as a statistician, it's not valid. It's like drawing a, a line through two points. You know, you draw a line, but it doesn't mean anything. So, so basically, the regression analysis, the, the FDEP and the Brevard County, you know, stakeholders are all disagreeing on that right now. Um, so, I, we'll, but the science we could talk about all day, honestly. Right. But the um, and I know some, some sometimes your eyes gloss over when you start getting into details. But 
the, the um, can you go to the next slide? The um, okay. Okay. basically mm -hmm. what we're we're at now is that we're struggling whether we want to continue water quality projects right now because we want to wait until there's some of these issues are resolved with FDEP. And it looks as though some of the issues are going to be resolved in the near future because they are now starting to move forward with looking at credit, crediting some of the new technologies. We have what we call a BMAP meeting in July. Hopefully that will result in some movement along those lines. And then we, they also agreed to have a workshop with the stakeholders um, in September, which we're hosting, our city's gonna be hosting. So um, we're encouraged that they are moving along those lines. But right now, um, we are, they are tech, the technical issues that we're seeing are so, so much to the point where we feel that if we continue investing in what we, have done in the past that will be investing badly, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the, the baffle boxes that we put in originally along Jackson, and one of the reasons why we didn't get as much credit as we do, as we did in later baffle boxes, is they were called first generation baffle boxes, and as I said, they didn't have trash racks. They didn't remove the vegetative debris. So we don't get as much credit, or any, basically any credit, for those type um, um, baffle boxes. But there is technology out there that says we can correct that if we use this denitrification material in one of the chambers um, to and just basically dump this material into the last chamber, let the water go in, sit in that, and then as it comes out, the, the, um, the material, the bold and gold or whatever it is, will eat the nitrogen before it, it, it heads out. And, that is a promising technology. But there again, it has to be quantified as far as what, what amount of removal you're getting and the credits that you'll receive for that type of um, um, And our point, our point to DEP has been there is data out there. You just need to, to look at it and figure out a credit system instead of wait for us to, to do it for you. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much our our argument is, right. you know, they have the data, they should create the crediting system and stop requiring local governments to do their research and development. Yeah, one um, of the things with muck removal too is that, you know, their argument about muck removal is if you go into a canal, you have to remove every bit of muck in that canal to get any credit. Well, you're trying to get around docks and things like that. If you, to me, if you get the, the, the major amount of credit muck in the middle of the canal, and you'll have, you'll have it slump into the middle eventually later, the rest of it, you clean it out again, you should get credit for what you clean. Right. But DEP doesn't look at it like that. So that's one of the arguments that we're having with DEP as far as, as muck. Can you go to the next slide? So, and this kind of summarizes what we just said, you know, that we're in a, di we're in a dialogue with DEP and we're, you know, trying to continue to improve the data and science upon which the TMDLs and compliance are based. So that's really what we're asking them to do is review our model, um, look at uh, a different way of looking at it. And we are basically recommending to defer implementing any new best management practices until some of these things are, are vetted out. We do have four years before regulatory reper repercussions, and we think that if we, if we worked with the EP for the next year, that we could get some of these issues resolved. Next slide. In terms of recommendations, we are recommending that we increase our stormwater utility rate to at least cover the operating and maintenance and repair and replacement costs that we have today. Um, this will save our general fund drawdowns, and this will also better represent the cost of stormwater management. I think right now people think that the $65 a year pays for that. It does not, and, it, and it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a false um, perception that we're pro providing to people if they think that that is actually covering our costs, because right now it is not. We are recommending to cancel the Lori Lane Stormwater Grant Project, and there's no, a number of reasons for that. First is we don't have the batch available for that project. Um, even when we go through the rate uh, increase that we're recommending, uh, we still won't have the match for that project. We also don't have the upfront cost for the reimbursement project. So, like I said, when we went through the reserve discussion, 
we have to we also carry reserves not just for emergencies but also for cash flow so we would in terms of like a project like this we would use reserves to pay for the project knowing that we're going to get paid back with the grant um, in this case we don't have the reserves to carry this project so we don't have the, the, the reserves to pay for the project up front we also don't believe that the effectiveness is effectiveness of the project is worth the cost at this point. So we're re-looking at our, our best management practices in, in, those, in those terms at this point. So we think that we, needed to, we need to take a step back. We may, we may decide in a couple years to go th through with the project, but right now we want to make sure that we get the best credit possible through FDP and we know that it's the best project to do when we're spending that much money on a project like this. Uh, we will know more um, after the July BMAP meeting, and staff will be, will be updating you after that meeting to tell you where we stand um, in terms of, of how well we're moving along. Um, and then we will, you know, again, we'll be, we'll be re discussing any remaining issues with FDEP in September. We are recommending that the stormwater utility um, fund cover the needs and, and these needs are the following this operation and maintenance which is approximately 140,000 a year system and renewal replacement we are recommending a $200,000 a year minimum and this is the minimum uh, suggested by our city engineer an equipment replacement uh, renewal which is $20,000 a year and then in terms of water quality this is something that we, were, we will be talking about as, at a future uh, rate discussion um, we would recommend that we uh, try to gain $100,000 a year and uh, $10,000 to $30,000 a year for good science, um, basically to carry, to rack up, or not rack up, <laughs> but rack up actually, um, approximately $400,000 <coughs> match for a $1 million project every four years. So most 319 and TMDL projects, you get a 60% of that, of that project covered by those grants. And that, so if we if we were to accumulate a uh, hundred uh, hundred thousand dollars a year for a four hundred thousand dollar match, we would be able to do a major water quality project every four years. In terms of muck removal, um, this is a big issue. We have one hundred eighty thousand cubic yards of muck in the city, approximately, and uh, two point seven million dollars, which is actually a pretty low estimate. Um, but one that the only one that we could find <laughs> of $15 a cubic yard to remove the muck. Um, so that is basically something that we will we really do need to consider in the future in terms of doing our part for the lagoon. And that would be a major water quality focus if we if we were to look at future rates. Um, do we have the funds that the state just allocated for the lagoon for demucking? Are we going to try to tap into? No, the. Basically, what the legislature did was provide Brevard County with $20 million to do, um, to do, to do demunking. Um, well, actually, it was only about $10 million to do the demunking, yeah. Um, so, and then $1 million of that is for FIT to come up with a way to study the impacts of that demunking. So they will be choosing where they're going to do it, and they're going to do it in an area that they could get the most bang for their buck and make sure that the city or the, the community can see an improvement. That's where they're going to do it. Whether that's near us, I don't know. But so there's approximately nine million left to do a project or that's project. Brevard County has nine million dollars to do a demucking project. Yes. Their problem is that if they spend $9 million and people cannot see that there was an improvement, you're probably going to have trouble getting the legislature to do any more for you. And so they're really wrestling with that, and that, I believe, is the focus of the work with FIT, with Dr. Treffrey and company, to figure out where do we spend this money so we can actually see an improvement. And they think it's going to cost them nine million to do the oh, no. Galley River? I don't I have no idea. The only reason I say that when we look at our canal system <laughs> and maybe we can get points from this. The county has a tremendous area of the canal systems from Pineda Causeway um, sa north south, excuse me, there's a lot in the county. Mm -hmm. Then we have Satellite Beach and then we have Indian Harbor Beach. 
So there's three governments involved in that one section, which to me is something that the public could see. So if there's any way to get any of those funds, if they're not going to use the nine million, I sure would like to see us make an effort because it would be visible. And it takes in more than one city. They're, they're, yeah, they're going to do it where they can see a, regra a, a seagrass regrowth. That's where they're going to yeah. try to focus on. The, the likelihood that that's going to be in finger canals is pretty low. So they're going to do that more in an open river area, in my opinion. That's where I see that happening. So they're, yeah. what their is that if they demuck O'Galley River, they will see seagrass grow there? I don't know. I don't know if the O'Galley River is their focus. Sebastian River, and it didn't happen, and they demucked Crane Creek. And there's no way seagrass is ever grown in any of those locations. So I hope that's not their only criteria that seagrass will grow because it absolutely hasn't in any of those areas so far, and especially in the mouth of Sebastian River, which I believe was the first one they did in the area. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no seagrass but right, to be right found. Now it's so I just want to make evident. sure that if there's 10 million out there and that doesn't cost 10 million, we have an area here that you know, is more than just Satellite Beach. In fact, it's a county, Satellite Beach, and Indian Harbor Beach. So, um, we are actually in probably weekly conversations with the county. So we will be glad to, to pass that on. But I'm pretty sure that um, they're they're going to base that decision on their what they think is the best science that, that they that when they think that they're going to get the best bang for that buck and basically be able to show the legislature you know, here's an improvement, so now we need X more dollars this coming year. <laughs> um, in terms of what we need to address our existing needs, our rate based on existing <coughs> system needs, and this would be excluding any major water quality projects. Now, that doesn't mean that, we, like what we do now, if we do a flood attenuation project, if we could add a water quality component to that, we always will try to do that. We've always historically done that, even prior to TMDL requirements. So, so when I say, when I, I want to emphasize the major, that means like the Lori Lanes, you know, the grant projects. This would be excluding those projects. We would need to bring in $520,000, and that would cover the $140,000 of operating and maintenance, $200,000 in system repla replacement and renewal, and $20,000 equipment replacement, and this would cover the $159,435 debt service. Now, I didn't include <coughs> next year's debt service or the year after because those are higher numbers, but I included this other lower debt service number because that's, that's the next three years of debt service, and I wanted to give a little bit more realistic of view of what that debt service would be. And this would require $104 ERU per year, okay? If we were to look at water quality, to add that component to the rate, we would, it would increase that 104 for an additional $20 a year. If we were to add muck removal to that concept, we would add an additional $27 for ERU to that, to that 104, okay? Those rates do not consider inflation, future NPDES requirements, additional staff, O and M and R and R for future added system components or equipment. <clears throat> it's hard to to bring. It's always hard to bring in. You, we never have enough money, you know, to do what we need. We never do. We always we always have to prioritize and look at, you know, how we kind of and reprioritize when things come up. And we understand that. Um, and we also understand $104 would be a sticker shock. So our recommendations. Um, would be either to increase the rate to $85 per ERU for fiscal year 14 and 15, and then increase the rate again to 104 in 15, 16. And then we would also recommend reviewing the rate each subsequent year based on the need for specific projects as our TMDL requirements are, need to be met. Or you could also just go ahead and increase the rate to 104 for fiscal year 15. And then again, we would have to review that rate each subsequent year based on the need for specific projects. I'll go to the next slide. Impacts to property owners with the recommended rate increase. 
commercial business owners and industrial business owners get um, a high, basically pay a higher rate, and that's largely because their properties are covered with asphalt, <laughs> with parking lots and larger buildings. And of the 125 units on the billing roll, the average impervious surface is approximately 17,000 square feet, which is substantially higher than the 3,000 square feet ER ERU. Okay. In 2013, the charge for 1202A1A, which is the Shell station, was $350.09. In 2014, the 2014 proposed rate of $85 ERU would increase to the 1202A1A to $457.81. That would be an increase of $100.72 per year, or $8.98 per month. And that's, again, for the 1202 Shell A1A, which is the Shell Street. For residential owners, a 14-15 increase to, of $85 per ERU would equal $20 per year, which would be an additional $1.67 per month. Now, if you go to the 104, that would double. Okay, those, those numbers would double. Okay. So basically, that, that's our recommendations. The, the need is 104. We did provide you a sheet here this sheet right here, which shows you the debt service. And if you go to the second page, you will see the budget analysis for the stormwater fund with an increase from $65 to $85 per year in 14-15. So you'll see that even with that, we still have a negative $26,535 coming out of general fund. And then in 15-16, if you go ahead and increase it to $104 per ERU, you'll see that we will begin accumulating repair and replacement dollars. In that first year, we'll get 106739 If you increase, increase the rate to 104 in fiscal year 14-15, you'll see that in 14-15, we will begin accumulating uh, repair and replacement dollars of $68,465 $68, for 14-15. So basically what it would do, um, if, you, if you did the rate in a two-step, we would just be deferring the rate repair and replacement to, to the next year, basically, okay? Which is, you know, I mean, it, it, it's basically the trade-off. It, it would be a sticker shock, um, for lack of a better word, when, you know, to, to see that rate increase that high or that much to some people. Um, or, um, or you look at the system needs and, you know, you, that's the trade-off that we're going to be looking at is, um, you know, do we want to, to make that change that fast, um, or do we want to defer some of our repair and replacement? Any questions from council? I, I think we have, um, we have two people in the state legislature who are going to be um, crucial for us to have discussions with on the issues we're having with FDEP. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you have Thad and you have Steve who are going to be players next year with how things play out with water quality and water issues in the state. I mean, they're, they're in our backyard and they're involved. So um, I think we need to get on an agenda to be able to, you know, to talk with them and explain the issues. And I, um, it's not just Satellite Beach, it's Brevard County that has these issues that we're not getting addressed by FDEP. So I think they need to be aware of that because they're going to be discussing all this stuff come committee meetings in about four or five, three, four months, actually, probably. As far as the fee itself, I would, you know, I mean, it's pretty obvious that we need to do something. And I would, um, I would look at the lesser rate initially to find out what's going to come out of the legislature next year. I mean, we may see something come out of um, of the legislature next year that's going to give us some relief. So rather than go up to the 104 right off the bat, I would I would stick with your first recommendation and and look at the 85 for the first year and see what happens, you know, in the legislature next year. I mean, you know, we we have quality of life issues here. That lagoon is a um, an economic engine for us, and uh, you know we have to do something. I think that's a start. What kind of relief do you um, 
suggest from the legislature? What are you? Well, I think we may see some <coughs> some things come down from the legislature that address the issues that FDEP. I mean, look at the issues that we had with DCA for all those years. All of a sudden, DCA disappeared when the legislature figured out that they weren't doing exactly what they should have been doing. And I'm not saying DEP is going to go away, but I think they can give FDEP direction on looking at some of the new technologies and making some decisions. And, you know, you either, you know, make a decision or get out. So, I mean, I'm looking for, and, and this is something that I think we can articulate to both that and Steve that, look, we're not getting the results that we need to get. We need you to give direction to these state agencies. And, and that's kind of a start for me. And I think we can at least have those conversations. And in return, we might have fewer requir requirements levied on us. Is that, is that what you're anticipating? I don't know if it'll be fewer requirements, but I think they will have a clearer picture of if we can use the material that you're talking about that can salvage some of the baffle boxes that we have out there so we don't have to spend money on top of money we've already spent. These are things that I think we can have discussions with them on. I mean, there, if there is technology out there that we can utilize and they're not giving us that opportunity to get credits for that technology because they don't have the science, well, I mean, we need to move forward. We need to do something. So I think the legislature can help us with articulating that to DEP. Uh, I look at it this way. I think it's a two-part thing. Is. One is an environmental concern, that we have to meet these numbers or whatever numbers will be eventually there. But that's not what I see this increase really doing, because if nothing changed, Allen still has to do something to Glenwood trunk line. It's just inevitable, and a lot of them. So if you take nothing that we, to go forward with the quality of the water and just worked on drainage issues, we still don't have the money. So yeah, I would love to, I mean, it affects me a lot, the quality of the water, and I want to see the quality of water. I don't think this has to do with quality of water right now because we don't know where that's going. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that we got from staking here, 60 percent of the system is 50 years old and failing. So not even to reach those numbers, but just to get the system so it doesn't collapse and people's yards don't flood. You know, I think that's the first money to be spent because the second is unknown. Mm -hmm. And so what would you be saying in terms of the well, I, I think, rate? Uh, again, I, I like to take it first with the $20 increase. And if between the year period that we will have here, we're going to learn a lot more mm -hmm. and make a start. I don't think it's something we got to jump immediately. And again, as we looked at the improvement plan, if something critical <laughs> happens this year, if we got a tropical depression that the line fails, then we have to make a decision at that point of what to do. So. Uh, and Dom, this is kind of directed to you. I mean, I'm not so confident that the legislature is going to be able to do much, but I, my question, my question is, um, could the league, Space Coast League, Florida League get involved in this, and if so, how? I mean, I, I mean, do we, and you may not want to take this one on, but I'll throw it at you anyhow. Could we take the lead on that through the league and begin to push that as an issue, or or what? I just, I'm just, I, the, the legislature can be attacked individually by each city, but overall, could we, as a group, kind of lead this to see what we could do? So I've got with Courtney, and we were talking on this the other day that if these numbers are not correct and the system that they have in place is not correct. City of Satellite Beach doesn't mean 10,000 people doesn't mean much to Tallahassee. Amen. But Bavard County with how many cities there are in Bavard that are on the lagoon system and other counties, Vero Beach and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think in numbers, if the Space Coast League of City would do something, I think that's the way we go get this jump started is through the League of Cities and, you know, as a unit, go to our representatives and approach them 
as a unit, because I just don't think Satellite Beach okay. is going to get its bang for its dollar and, by going and, ourselves. And this, isn't just, this isn't just an Indian River Lagoon issue. You know, the policy committees that the League sets up, and you sit on the Environmental Quality Board, that's going to be the board that's going to be the voice um, for what you're talking about, Mark, mm -hmm. because the issues that we're looking at with DEP are a statewide issue. Mm -hmm. They're going on in Clearwater, they're going on in, in Naples and Bonita <laughs> Beach and down the East Coast and up the East Coast. So this is a position that the Environmental Quality Board for the League of Cities needs to take up. And I know that water quality was number one on their list last year. It's going to be number one on their list this year. And I think you're in a position to be able to articulate that best in your, in your committee there when you go to these meetings because we're going to start meeting, I think, in August. In August, in August yeah. In August we have our first meeting. So yeah. the League of Cities is going to be crucial in handling this issue. It's a statewide issue. It's right. not just a Brevard County issue. If DEP is not handling information in a timely manner, then the league and the legislature can together ask them. together yeah. for them to get their act. I, I, did, I did confirm with Senator Altman he will be at our workshop in September. Um, and then I spoke with uh, Representative Debbie Mayfield today, and she is very interested in that workshop. So, because again, even though she doesn't represent our area, it's more in River County, it's still the same issues are yep. up, you know. And part of the part of everyone else's problem too that we didn't mention tonight is the um, permitting any project. Sometimes, it, like if you're just doing a water quality project, Air Army Corps in St. John's holds up your permits because you're not doing any flood attenuation. <laughs> So there's like a disconnect with the state and federal agencies on the same thing. And so they're, everyone's having that problem throughout the state. So um, there is, there's a rising interest now um, to, for, on the legislators' part to help us out. So that, that's been encouraging. And I think DEP is starting to understand that because they have been making a movement to address some of our concerns. Good. Okay, so to follow up. I mean, we understand it needs to be legislative and Space Coast League of Cities or the League of Florida League of Cities and that sort of thing. <coughs> Can we somehow, since we're having this meeting uh, here with that Altman and all that sort of thing, can we somehow generate some interest from our Space Coast League of Cities that they need to start sending people to this meeting? And uh, all of the stakeholders in Brevard County will be at this meeting. Okay. Yeah. So it, when, when I say when I say we, uh, we're, we are literally talking about every city in, in Brevard County. And Brevard County... Um, has been the Natural Resources Department was instrumental in helping put, the, put all this together. So they've been talking with us about the agenda and everything. So it's really we're talking about the Bar County stakeholders. Yeah. So is, is is the idea coming out of this meeting that there'll be a, a plan moving forward and yes. approach moving forward? Because we're just at a sticking point where we're back and forth letter writing and it's not we're not yeah. sinking in in, in the. So we, we basically said, okay, we're going to go through the July BMAP meeting, determine what new technologies they're willing to credit, and then we will talk about all the remaining issues at, in, at the September workshop. And because we wanted to also present to them the financial side of our utilities, because I don't think they, you know, sometimes when you're in, in the state level, you, you have that disconnect. And they, you know, in the how we cannot afford to do their R&R, you know, their, their research and development for them. We, we just can't afford that. And one last thing, just regarding the rate, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Dom, I support you with the 85. I think that's where we start and go from there. Um, I also see it as a two-part part issue, water quality and stormwater, just like the mayor. And I, I don't really have a problem holding on the Cassia pro a project or no, uh, no problem holding on the water quality projects. But, and I really have no problem with um, supplementing or supporting <coughs> public works um, and their operating expenses through the general fund. What I would like to see is to see the proposed budget and see what the Avalorum tax is bringing in before we propose any kind of increase because there may be a way to pay for those operating expenses using general funds and or capital asset funds. So that's just my, my theory on it because I haven't seen a proposed budget and I don't know what the proposed revenues are. I understand the need. I understand the system is old. I know the streets are wearing. It's, it's, it's a complex situation. We not only need to replace the stormwater pipes, but we need to repave our roads, roads as well. So that's what I would like to see before I support any increase at all. 
I would support the um, $85 amount. And um, in the past, when the city has had a big issue um, to face, we've uh, put out a special edition of the Beach Caster. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this issue is sufficiently large and sufficiently complex that we would do well to get the word out in a special edition again. And I know somebody who would volunteer to do it. <laughs> Courtney, have you taken a look at projected revenues this year on Ad Valorum, and where would that stand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't we don't really have any revenues in general fund to carry the stormwater fund. I mean, we would be looking at service cuts, like what we what we would be cutting. So there's just not enough money in the general fund to carry the stormwater fund. <laughs> any further questions right before I open up the public comment? Cheryl, did you get all yours in? Yeah, for now. Um, public comments on <coughs> this agenda item. I know it's large. Joanne Regan, resident. Um, I'm going to agree with the mayor on this. Um, regardless of uh, where we go as a state and as a county, um, we still have to pay our daily bills. And $20 as a homeowner is barely <laughs> worth blinking about $20 for a homeowner. Where it really gets to be concerning for residents and business owners is when you're talking about a business. And we have an X number of businesses in Satellite Beach. And I wonder if it would be worth pulling maybe the top half of those business owners and see if it, it would be a financial burden to go up the greater percentage. Um, for a homeowner to go from $20 a year increase to a $40 an increase in a, in a year, that's really not a very much money. The people we need to be concerned about are the business owners, um, but there may not be resistance there if that amount of money would not impact them in a negative way. Perhaps that's something they would consider. But the longer we put off generating additional income for these goals that are bearing down on us in the not too distant future, the more we're going to have to be creative and have meetings like this because we didn't take action now when we could without unduly burdening everyone. Um, I also think that you're right, we, we can talk to the state all day, but it is people like um, Courtney and people like the Marine Resources Council and um, groups like um, the Sierra Club that are going to put pressure on the state to say, these are the things we need to do, this is the research we need to be looking at. Um, you can put pressure on them, but we really need to deal with what our city is looking at today, and that's <coughs> draining off hurricane waters when we have a hurricane. That's the big issue. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comment? Yes, sir. Uh, Harry Pollack, 748 Atlantic Drive. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, city staff uh, very much for accumulating this information and presenting it in such a outstanding uh, manner that was uh, completely understandable, I think, to anybody in this audience, and the emphasis on how important this issue is. I personally am opposed to using general funds money to handle O&M of, of uh, the stormwater. I think it should be a separate issue. I absolutely, totally support an increase in the fee to $104 in fiscal year 14 and 15, and as identified earlier, this amounts to a Big Mac once a month. It's not going to break anybody. It's really an important issue that we can't delay. Let's put the money where our mouth is, and let's stand tall and accumulate the reputation that Satellite Beach has throughout Brevard County. We are the leaders. We see this as important, and we're out in the lead. Thank you. Thank you. Further public comments? Roger Goodis, Satellite Beach resident. First I'd like to state is I pull down the agenda packet tonight as of oh, about an hour ago. 
still this PowerPoint presentation is not on there. I would assume that however late it was taken care of, you don't have to, according to the Attorney General, put it up. You don't have to. But you know what? There's a lot of residents out here who have a lot of experience from the past. Engineers, uh, physicists, you name them. Lawyers, accountants, CPAs, they all know what this is. And not to have this out there at this point and refurbish it through the beach caster is, is egregious. This community talks about taking the lead and doing it in things. I find that horrific that this is not out there. I have fought for this about five years ago, the back end of storm waters. And I'm not going to get into it right now because I'm limited to three minutes. Furthermore, I'm going to state it's only a burger once a month for somebody at McDonald's. I've heard that nomenclature before. Well, maybe it's a heart pressure medication. Maybe it's blood pressure medication, to be more exact, that is more important to a person who's on a fixed income. $104 may make the difference for that person to live or not to live, or a dignity in life. And then furthermore, I'm going to state 325 to 422 to 500,000, 100, 101,000 to 140,000, businesses are going to be concerned when they see their fair share. And then I'm going to further gavel myself out right now because we talk about other things. We don't have the budgets in front of us and this is a workshop and I appreciate your efforts. I really do, especially staff. Where's the sea oats to preserve the beach? Thank you for your comments. Public comments still open. Hearing none, close the public. Any more public comments? Gail Abrams, CRA resident. Um, the fact is that at the end of the day, the stormwater utility fund is broke. Is that a fact? I believe that's a fact. We're pretty close to it, okay? Um, that's not a good thing, okay? Now, I think we should go for $104 a year. I think it's going to be difficult for some of the folks that are on Social Security because I think we only got a 1.5 increase, okay? All right? Um, but, you know, let's, let's do it. Explain it to the citizens through the beach caster, which I think is a good idea. Um, you know, get people to understand what has happened here, and let's do it. Now, the other thing is um, maybe it's something we need to take a look at because I think there's another community that did this. They did an assessment on homeowners that lived on canals regarding muck removal. And that might be something to think about for the properties that are on canals, okay, going forward. But, you know, I think we're going to, we, we have no choice. We have to do something here with this fund because there's no money in it, okay? Thank you. Um, the, the figure increase is to 104, but it's only a $40. It's a $40 right. increase to it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Further public comment? Hearing none, back to council. Council comments? Yeah, I just have a few comments. Um, you know, I hear, oh, 20 bucks isn't going to make or break it, but there's 10, approximately 10,000 people in this community, 30% are children. A lot of people are making decisions whether their kid is going to play a sport in high school or in middle school because it costs them money. Uh, if they're going to be in band, uh, if their kid can play Little League, which one's going to play Little League, which one's not. And it can make or break a lot of people in this community. I would like to see the budget figures before I make a decision. Um, that's all I'm saying. I don't have a problem with it, um, with the uh, general fund supporting 
um, our capital assets, our infrastructure, but I haven't seen the numbers to show any different, and that's where I stand on the issue. Okay. Further comments? Yeah, I'm not interested in seeing the capital assets fund um, get into this or the general fund get into this because the stormwater utility fee is what has been designated to take care of our stormwater issues. Um, I think that I think that I I would like to see um, numbers of um, I'd like to see the difference between raising it to um, $85 a year uh, versus raising it to $104 a year uh, in terms of a specific budget. Do you follow that? Thank you. Because <laughs> this is the issue. We had this workshop to get direction from you so we could do the budget. Because when we're talking about if we're going to if we're going to raise the rates to eighty-five dollars, we have to come up with twenty-six thousand five hundred thirty-five out of general fund to pay for the stormwater. If we raise it to one hundred and four, we don't have to do that. Okay. Now, general fund, we're experiencing we're budgeting right now an eleven percent increase in health care costs. Everybody's doing that. It's Affordable Care Act. Everybody knew this increase was coming. We knew this increase was coming. So that's taking a large percentage of any increases we're getting with property valuations. We also lost first responder funds. Okay, so, so there's some budget hits that we don't have money in general fund to carry the stormwater fund. So we needed to know this from you in general, generally, before we could give you a proposed budget. So that's why we had this workshop, largely to, to talk about this and, and get direction. The, the budget analysis we gave you for the utility itself provides you with an $85 increase in 14.15, the first recommendation, the two-step. That's the first one. And then the second is the increase from 65 to 104 outright. I guess what I'm asking for is what specifically would we be funding if we went to, to 85 a year versus what specifically we would be funding if we went to 105 a year? You're going to fund, if you do the $85 a year, you're going to fund your $311,535 in debt service. You're going to fund 140000 in maintenance expenses. And that's all you're going to fund mm -hmm. because $26,535 of those maintenance expenses are going to come out of general fund. Okay. If you go to $104,000 or $104 per ERU, you're going to fund your debt service, you're going to fund your maintenance, and you'll have $68,465 left over to do R&R. &R. And we have $25,000 programmed in the capital assets right now to do stormwater line replacements. So, so if if Alan had $68,000 to program, he could rattle off at the top of his head what he would do tomorrow <laughs> if he had that money sitting there. I can, I can tell you that. And that's what I'm interested in knowing. Oh, he's, we, we keep a, there's the capital improvement budget you see, and then here there's his spreadsheet. <laughs> so yes, so he could give you what he could spend on that, what he would prioritize. Yes, we could do that. Can we ask Alan that question? Could sure, you pop that off the top of your head right now? There's three that I'm thinking of right oh, sorry. Sorry. There's three that I'm thinking of right off the top of my head. One is the line that runs between Sherwood, the corner at Sherwood and the Glenwood trunk line. Um, when you make that corner every time it rains, you know that that is underwater. Well, I think the main reason for that is is that line it's an eight it's a eighteen inch or yeah, 18 inch line that runs all underneath all those trees there, big giant oaks that are in that, you know, there's one in your, your mom's yard, there's one, um, well, actually all along that trunk. So if we abandon that line, move it out on the road, we might be able to solve some of that drainage issue 
right there. So that would eat up a good portion of that $68,000. There's another one that's on um, DeSoto between Verbena and Rosada. If you walk down that sidewalk, you can see sidewalks sinking, driveways sinking. That's an old corrugated aluminum pipe that is failing badly and needs to be replaced. And I, that's, that's another one. That's just two right off the top of my head. Well, I think this is good and we need, like, the beach caster. Like, so we got to sell this yes. because of this. If we, if we raise this to the 104, people want to see something done. They're going to want to see the roads, excuse the expression, being torn up and the drainage being taken care of. They want to see where their dollar is at work. Whereas if we raise it, excuse me, the only the $20, they're not seeing anything. Is, is, is one way. And, but at some point, we have to do this because, you know, of 60%, you know, there's obviously failures going on now. So um, I, I remember us talking about this in the late 90s and 2000 that, I mean, mm -hmm. we've talked about this a long time. The system's not getting any better if we don't do something. So. Basically, what we do with $20 is we don't do anything. We're just paying our bills to make sure we can get to, we're really not paying our bills. The system, being storm order, is losing $26,500 a year. Um, so, you know, and, and I look at it this way. The lagoon is a pretty hot issue right now. I mean, it's every where people are talking about it. I think if there's ever a time to sell it right, now's the time to sell it right. And, you know, we've done really well on grants. So if we don't do something, then it's, we're going to take up the whole hit on projects. Where if we have, we know when we had funds, we didn't take up the hell hit. So um, I'm up for either way as long as, I, I like to see it, so that the public gets to see what's being done. If nothing gets accomplished out there, the roads still flood. And it's the $104 amount that it will take to let them see that something is being done with their money. So, uh, you know, I, and again, I, I understand it's from Dean, where's the, and you said, where's the budget? I, I'm interested in the budget plus all right, where are we going to use that money? Where is the project that we're going to put that money to use to make a difference in the community? And this is something that needs to be done regardless of what the legislature does about uh, DEP. Um, so, so that's know, not anything we, to do with DEP. Yeah, as we talk this through, it seems to me that the 104 amount really is the um, correct one to go with. And again, this needs to be explained very carefully uh, to our residents so that they understand what we're doing and what they will be getting for their money. And when we look at the $104 amount, we're talking about $2 and something and change uh, additional each month. So, um, you know, it's not even the proverbial hamburger. So, um, and, and I think, you know, in the past when we've done these beach casters and explained things thoroughly, our residents have supported them. And, and I think we need to do that again. You know, it's something that's happened. It's something that we've had to, we should have done a lot earlier. But, you know, here we are. Shouldas are great. But if we went back 50 years at the beginning of the city and there was a fund put aside, another story. But it wasn't. So we, as a council, the city are left with what we have today. And that's a system that is in dire need of a repair. Can dire need of a repair. You know, I, I under, there was a fund put in place, and it increased in the, when, the, when the bubble burst and times were bad and the, and the rate kept going up. But then we put a debt against it, a debt service, which a lot of people will claim the city doesn't have, which is really the reason for this increase. I do have a question, though. Will the street sweeping come out of the general fund, or is it going to come out of the stormwater utility? Out of the stormwater utility. And, and so what I'm saying is just because we have a stormwater utility fund doesn't mean we need to create all that money for stormwater. It can come, like you said, from capital assets. There's money from it and from the general fund. So all I'm seeing is you're not raising the ad valorem tax. You're taking the $20,000 for the street sweeping and you're turning it into a stormwater utility 
not out of the Lorem tax, and I have a real problem with that. So I'm not going to support any increase at this time. Well, my only thing on what we had in we created so-called debt was that we had the ability to fix a problem where we got matching funds. And again, we didn't have to absorb the hit totally by ourselves. We got a lot of bang for our dollar to do projects. We could have taken the approach back then of not doing it like that and wait until we saved money. And every year, the cost of doing the project continually rises. Because if you look at the figures we have here, look at the figures to do the same work as it did 10 years ago. It costs a lot more, and it's not going to get cheaper. So we did borrow the money, and yes, we owe it back, but it was to create a stormwater system that worked through the stormwater fund. And, you know, if not, I can tell you I've lived here a long time. I remember when courts would fill up with water after a rain, and for a week the kids had swimming pools, and people could not get their cars out. And these were projects that we had to tackle over time. And, well, I sure don't like spending money, and, and I'm a taxpayer the same as everybody else. But the stormwater is critical here. I mean, and we're, I don't call it being in debt. Yes, we owe money for it, but those projects needed to be done. They were things that were, that they were, they were broken. They were required. It, exactly. EMDL requirements. Yep. So, and, that, and they were mostly paid for with grant money. A lot of them it was paid the for by grants. And I'd like to have money in our system so that we can get grants. Without? Can I address the capital assets please, real yeah. quick? I, I just wanted to point out, we, we were talking about the capital improvement program prior to this. And aside from the redevelopment projects that are coming out of the community redevelopment fund, Everything else this coming year is a must-have. We must have this, otherwise we will, we will be paying a greater cost later. We have to resurface the tennis courts. We have to replace playgrounds. Some of the playground equipment we have, we have actually taken apart and removed portions of the, of the playground to, because of safety concerns. We have we have to replace handheld radios to stay on track for the full replacement requirement in two years. We have to continue to replace patrol vehicles because we were we had a five-year gap of not buying cars that were to the point where if we don't replace them, they break down. In net, in 15, 16, fiscal year 15-16, we were talking about paving roads. That's $300,000. The capital assets fund brings in around $424,000 a year. So I'm not real sure there's a lot of money there to spend on stormwater projects when you have all of these other capital needs that are outside of the stormwater system. And additionally, the general fund, unless we cut services or raise the millage rate, it cannot afford to pay for the stormwater utility. I think, I think Frank hit the nail on the head when he said, you know, this is an opportune time for us to be looking at the ramifications that stormwater um, has on the Indian River Lagoon. And the Indian River Lagoon is a hot topic right now. Um, I would like to I would like to diffuse any of the debt issue stuff by having the Beachcaster article explain totally how we did what we did, what we got in grant money because the grant money number is going to be way higher than what we used as debt service to pay for the improvements that were made in our city. So I want to make sure that the Beachcaster article has all that information in it so we don't have people coming back and saying, what about the debt? Because the debt was there to get the projects done at probably 30 to 40 cents on a dollar. And that money wasn't going to come back again. And if you look at the creation of when we put the stormwater in place in 97 at $36, it was nine years before it went up, and it's been five years since the last increase. Had we been doing something incrementally on a yearly basis, we wouldn't be here having this discussion today. 
if we go ahead with this, there's one thing I would like to see us to get back on track with. Not that you just go out and get grants to say you got a grant, but I also think where we need it to help us with the cost of this incredibly expensive you know, projects that, you know, we need to, where we have a project, to try to match a grant with it to save us money. We need to get back on that because we did bring in a lot of money into the city for stormwater with grants. And whether we brought that in, if we didn't bring that in, then our debt service would be tremendous because we have to fund it totally by ourselves. And uh, so, again, we need to make the effort to go another step for our citizens and get those grants while they're out there so we are not totally footing the bill. Because we've done great on grants. But I just don't want to get a grant just to go out and say, hey, I got a grant. That doesn't help us. Where we have a project and a need, it just helps the citizens. So, and so. that's always been the policy behind the grants that were pursued. We've done good. So. Any other part? Okay. So is the direction tonight, I want to make sure I understand that, is the direction tonight that we're going to put together a beach caster article that will outline the two financial alternatives that are available. Uh, we'll direct Courtney to go ahead and pre prepare the budget with those two alternatives at this time. And then we'll make a decision as we get closer to the budget which one of these two we're going to go based on the beach caster article and the feedback we get between now and then. Is that the direction we're doing? No, that's not what I thought. Um, I think that Courtney is looking for a number, not a choice, and two, two budgets. And when we do the beach caster, um, at least the way we've done them in the past, and I know how they were done because I wrote every one of them, um, we, the council set a policy and the beach caster explained what that policy was. Uh, it, it wasn't a poll, it wasn't a survey. Um, and as I said, uh, when, the, when we've taken that approach before, our residents have understood what the council was doing uh, and has supported the action. So the speech caster would be the same thing. It would be what the council uh, decides to go with, whether it's the $85 amount or the $104 amount, and explain in that beach caster why that number was chosen, what we'll get with it, what we would not have gotten had we done something different. Do you feel, Courtney, that we can get this in the beach caster given the number of pages that are in the beach caster? Can oh, yeah. I think what I think. I want to make sure we, they know everything about it. I think Vice edition. Mayor Scott was talking about a special edition, like a whole another one, like in addition to the typical beach Fine. masters. I just want to make sure we have enough pages and it's explained because this is important to do that. It's got to be out there. The information has to be there. We could, it would be nice, too, if, if we could solicit some of the, you know, environmental community to submit, you know, articles on the condition of the lagoon, you know, from, you know, some of the the participants in our stakeholder groups that might be an informative way to discuss the you know condition of the lagoon as part of that beach caster and why we are what, having to do water quality yeah. projects and well, I'm, I'm a little confused because no. yeah. no. we're totaling off on water quality projects this is storm water related this the focus is storm water so i don't want to see a spin put on this with the, uh, you know, I'm all about the Indian River Lagoon and also the, the, the quality of life here in the city, but don't put a spin on it like we're going to improve the quality of the lagoon, lagoon when we're holding off on water quality projects. State the fact that it's we have to replace our storm water pipes. It will like improve I, the quality of the water at a point down here. If you see the way the fund increases, we are going to have to do water quality, and water quality is absolutely a part of it. We don't know what those new numbers are the way it's going to be. But you still, it's still, the fund is still going to be used for water quality. We're just not doing the project. Not in the immediate right. future, though. Well, I would say not in the one year, too, but I would pretty much guarantee you that this, they're going to make us do a project to keep up with all these loads in the BMAP. Yeah, we will have to. Yeah. It's gonna. We're gonna need the funds in here. It doesn't mean we have to spend the funds when they're in here. But water quality is is a huge water, issue. Water but right now we can only control 
the flow of the water get it like, off our street. Like I said in the in the presentation, every project, every flood attenuation and drainage project we do, we try to include a water quality component to it. So we try to capitalize that on that. When we talk about major water quality projects like the Grant 319s and things like that, that's a different different story. But when we when we do any of our projects, our baffle boxes, things like that, they're all they all have that idea in mind. It's not just flood and drainage. We always try to include a water quality component to that. So everything we do is is an effort, both from a drainage standpoint and an environmental standpoint. Well, so it's not a spin. It's just it's, it's a different a, level. A tax is a tax, and I think it's important to let the people know that, you know, the street streeping was paid for out of the reserve, and, and, and it's going to be funded out of this fund. To me, a tax is a tax, whether it's not abalorum or abalorum. So if the sweeping, let me ask this. I'm just trying to gather yeah, conversation. If the sweeping was done and we get credits for it for storm water credits, then isn't it a storm water issue? Maybe we've been paying it out of general funds because we didn't have the money in the storm water where it's really should come out of. I can't. I can't answer. Street. No. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Please. Thank you. Is that where it came from and why? Yeah. We didn't have the funds and we were. Well, I don't know why. Okay. I mean, I wasn't here, so I just know that it was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, in the past, it came out of general funds. Correct. Well, I mean, it may not be that particular item, but the cost of the stormwater utility operation and maintenance is $140,000 a year, and we're on, we're only the stormwater fund is only paying 101. Okay. Right. Direction? 104. I, I, I just think that it's it's too much to lay on the people at once. I get, Frank, I get your position that you're going to see something for that 104 versus not, but I think the reaction, especially from the business community, is going to be, wow. And I would personally rather see the more conservative side at this point. And, and the one situation here was how much? About a hundred dollar increase. That was for the eighty-five. Yeah. And then if it went to one hundred four, you'd just double that. Okay. So that would be a two hundred dollar a year increase for a business owner. So that's, that's pretty good. And that's my concern. It, it, I, I, again, I want to say it again. I, you make total sense that you're going to see something for, for the dollars that you correct versus uh, collect versus what you won't see on the other side. But I just think that's just going to be huge on somebody who's got a business. My only concern is we have no safety valve at all in the system. And we have streets that flood now. And you know, how long... You know, is that going to last? Um, they're going to flood. How's it going to work? If Glenwood went down or some of the others, then we would be coming in here and having to get loan or borrow money somewhere and funds to get the project going. We have no safety net, zero. Um, so my, my concern is that this should have been done long ago, but that's not where we're at. I, I agree. And, you know, we got to start getting the system in shape. No matter what anybody says of where the street sweeper, and no disrespect, where the money came from sweeping the streets, the stormwater system is failing. It, you know, mm -hmm. it's failing. Well, I, I agree. It's, it's, but, you, you know, take the money for the sweeper wherever, it doesn't put, make the stormwater system any better. And it needs to be better. That's the whole object behind it. And my, and my thought is, is at least with the 85, it shows we're moving in a direction. But it's not as aggressive as that, that's kind of where I'm at. But I can, I can live with both. I just, you know, we need something to go. We need to do something. The system is not working. You know, there are 295 commercial businesses in the city, stores. Um, and... Um, there are almost 5,000 residences. We're talking about, for the residences, a difference of $2 and some cents per month. 
for businesses, for the 295 businesses, we're talking about um, less than $20 a month additional. And it seems, it doesn't seem reasonable to make our decision based on the 295 versus the almost 5,000. And I can assure you that when I write the Beachcaster, the special edition Beachcaster, it will be well explained. And, um, and there will be a full explanation of what we're doing, where we're going, and what the consequences would be if we don't do this. It'll be the full picture. And um, so I just think that we're in this position now. It doesn't matter how we got here. It's incumbent upon us to move us forward again. And that would be, I think, the 104 amount. Can I ask a question? If yeah. the street sweeping didn't come out of this stormwater fund, would you be for it? No, no. Okay. I, it's it's okay. the fact that a tax is a tax. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, when you raise abalorm tax, everybody kind of flips out. Well, you're raising taxes. It's something I'm not in favor of. And how do we Regardless, fix I, regard, and I And it's nothing towards Allen or the system. But we need to do it in a gradual manner, um, take a look at it slowly. We didn't get in this position overnight. We're not going to cure it overnight. We have problems with the CRA and then now returning the TIF money and trying to build our reserves. I mean, it, there's a lot going on here, and I just don't think you realize some of the conditions some of the people are in in this community. A lot of kids, are they don't have lunch every day. They come back to school on Monday. They're, they're hungry. And to say $2.97 does make a big difference to some of the folks in this community. So I, I think I understand the situation. It's not failing. It's not like the streets are going to collapse and the world's going to come to an end in a year. This tax could be held off for a year. Um, we, we're still going to have to pay for engineering costs any time we try to uh, do com some kind of um, stormwater piping. So where's that money going to come from? I think a better plan could be created before we uh, increase the tax. Okay. Count direction. 104. Speak. I kind of like Mark. I mean, I understand this stuff needs to be done. Um, and I, I articulated it right in the beginning. I think doing it at the 85 the first year and then going up to 104 the second year um, is a little bit more conservative. We still end up coming out where we end up coming out. Um, we're just $26,000 short the first year. The second year, we have money in the plus the second year. You're, you're a zero. I'm at zero, and I, I also okay, think great. the city manager okay. should write the beach cash audition, or I'd like to see it before it goes out. Um. I'm, I'm going to go with the more conservative on it. Um, I think it's a better approach to start. And um, but I, I, I want to see the 104 to be there because we've got to get some projects done. Um, and, and it gives us, I think, a little bit of breathing room right there to um, see what's going to happen with the BMAP and so forth. And I think that message, when you write that message, it, it's a good message. I think when you write that message, it's a good message to write to the residents that we're being concerned about the fact that, you know, we don't want to go up on it that much in the first year, but here's the reality. Here's where we're going. We may know a little bit more based on what's going to happen with FDEP and whether they're going to be looking at the technology that's out there that they're not making decisions on now. So, um, I'm comfortable with, with the 85 for the first year. I'm going to ask you a question. Where are you getting, where are you getting the 26,535 from? 
That'll just get to just come out of general fund. We'll just balance the budget with that as an expense. Further discussion on it? No, Mr. Mayor, I, I, again, I'm going to say this, and I said I already said it once, but I do want to say it again. I do agree with your position on the on the numbers and the not doing something versus the appearance of doing something. I think you are totally correct. I just think from a citizen standpoint, it will be more palatable to understand that we're taking some action, but we're forward thinking that we're going to have to move up over the next few years to accomplish exactly what you outlined. So I, I want to make sure we get this going forward, and if I said 104, then we're at a tie. And where, where are we going to go with, no, I, with it from no, there? So I'm, I'm, I think this will get us going in that direction. And again, I, I'm a believer that we've, we've got to do a good job of letting the residents know on this. Amen. The information has got to be there. Yep. So, and, that, and as you do it, if you would let us have input, read it before the final, I think that's all. The council always approves special right. edition beach casters before they go out. But, that's suit uh, everybody. And, and so is the scenario here that it'll be eighty-five dollars uh, the first year, and then in FY fifteen sixteen it'll automatically go to one hundred four. Is that what we're saying? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I'm saying. I agree with that completely. Okay. Just the question: the mailing for the beach caster, how much is it costing each time? Did you or just the? Yeah, it's around three thousand. Three, three grand. Okay. Okay. So, any further? business okay first to the staff to put all this together I know I've came in many times and you work a lot of hours and thank you very very much for it um, I know the work's just starting but again thank you Courtney thank you very much there enough for their business meetings adjourned <clears throat>